by words now. Words now why. Now why words. A picture containing person, indoor, person, cell phone. A person riding on the back of a bicycle. A group of people in a field. A picture containing road, outdoor, building, street. A train yard. A group of people standing next to a fence. A tree on a dirt road. A group of baseball players standing on top of a dirt field. A group of people that are standing in the sand. A picture containing grass, outdoor, field, giraffe. A large green field with trees in the background. A car parked in front of a building. A traffic light sitting on the side of a road. A blue sign in front of a building. A group of people on a busy city street. A car driving on a city street. A person smiling for the camera. A group of people sitting in a chair talking on a cell phone. A person walking down the street talking on a cell phone. A statue of a person. A person in a car. A person riding a bicycle on a city street. A group of people walking down a street next to a fire hydrant. A picture containing indoor, kitchen, sitting, room. A bottle of items on a table. A picture containing cake, snow, peace, sitting. A piece of food on a plate. A store inside of a building. A large building. A picture containing road, building, outdoor, trunk. A group of people sitting on a bench. A picture containing grass, outdoor, building, fire. A person standing in front of a building. A person sitting on a bench. A group of people walking down a street. A group of people walking down a busy city street. A picture containing person, indoor, table, child. A picture containing table, wooden, sitting, bench. A person walking down a street, next to a sign. A group of people looking at each other. A close-up of a brick building. A person taking a selfie. A living room filled with furniture and a large window. A group of people walking on a city street. A group of people walking on a bridge. A large building. A picture containing outdoor, grass, fence, building. A bench in front of a building. picture containing building, outdoor, sidewalk, street. A bus that is parked on the side of a road. A pole that has a sign on the side of a building. A large building. A person standing in front of a building. A narrow city street with tall buildings. A city street. The tree next to a fence. A 
city street filled with traffic surrounded by tall buildings. A close-up of a person's face. A picture containing sitting, table, food, cat. A construction site in the middle of a city street. A close-up of a bird perched on top of a wooden pole. A brick building. A bird sitting on top of a building. A sink and a window. A picture containing building, outdoor, rail, bench. A close-up of a busy city street. A tall building in a city. A graffiti-covered building. The inside of a building. A building with graffiti on the side of the street. The side of a building. A gate in front of a fence. Scaffolding in front of a building. A person crossing the street in front of a building. A picture containing bench, building, wooden, sitting. A sign on the side of the street. A picture containing sitting, small, wooden, book. An orange sign on a city street. A bench on a city street. A couple of lawn chairs sitting on top of a table. A car driving on a city street filled with traffic surrounded by tall buildings. A group of people walking on a city street. A group of people sitting on a park bench. A narrow city street. A group of people holding a sign. A city street in front of a building. A picture containing building, outdoor, bicycle, parked. A large building. A large brick building. A large brick building. A view looking out of a window. A picture containing indoor, table, cup, kitchen. A wooden cutting board. A close-up of a door. A picture containing outdoor, laying, lying, street. A group of people walking in front of a store. A sign on the side of a building. A group of people walking in front of a crowd. So uh, that was a, a piece that I made last year, and uh, it kind of came about accidentally where um, I was working on a PowerPoint presentation for a, um, a lecture, and uh, I noticed that uh, this alt text function, which I had never used before, it started uh, popping up. and. Um, what, what this was, was a, a um, artificial intelligence description of, uh, that was supposed to identify the images uh, in the photographs. And uh, what struck me was when it was accurate, when it wasn't. I titled the piece Free Association, but the AI descriptions are supposed to, you know, they aspire to be accurate. Uh, one of the things that um, struck me about the, um, sort of like the collection of descriptions was often AI would locate other technology, typically cell phones in the photos, even if they weren't there, you know? So there was something 
in the algorithms that wanted to see uh, cell phones. And, um, and I, I think that the development of this whole technology was a, reflects a kind of desire for um, a kind of fluidity and maybe even some fantasy of transparency between image and words. And um, you know, of course, like the alt text function, I think was developed for um, unsighted people who you know, may need to navigate websites or something like that. I'm not exactly sure how it plays out because it's still, uh, I would think that it would be easier to see an image than to read a text. But anyway, these texts are provided as an aid ostensibly um, to people using PowerPoint or other image-based uh, programs. Um, to make the video, I, t I took those uh, texts and then um, I just used a text-to-voice synthesizer uh, that allowed me a, a range of about two dozen different voices. And um, uh, so it was kind of a, it was kind of a piece. Uh, it, it was sort of anti-free association in that it uh, intended uh, to be descriptive, uh, but then it was kind of similar to free association in that it was an automated process, you know, and if one thinks of surrealism and say like the, uh, the project of automatic writing or something like that, that there was uh, a sense of producing another meaning through some kind of automated process. Uh, Anyway, I lost my notes here. I'll just open them back up again. Um, so, Simone, we can go to that PowerPoint slideshow. Of um, I just want to talk about like sort of a background where um, I think that I was part of a generation of artists uh, that. Um, studied and began making art at kind of like an inflection point between um, modernist art and postmodern practices. Not that my generation was the first, but it, um, I think um, certain conditions really intensified with my generation. And you know, particularly in the US, uh, the American version of modernism uh, was, um, after a certain point, after, after Clement Greenberg's uh, criticism, it was supposed to hinge on some notion of pure visuality. In other words, images that um, were autonomous, uh, that had broken away from description, from literature. Uh, you know, and if one thinks of um, like the origins of Western art coming out of sacred art. You know, a lot of art was expected to uh, convey religious narratives. So modernism saw itself as a kind of freeing from that. But um, as modernist formalism developed, I think it started to be, started to feel oppressive. And um, there was a kind of return to language um, when I studied in school, most of my teachers were conceptual artists. And their, um, well, actually what first interested me in conceptual art, well, when I was uh, still in high school, um, I was a bit of a hippie and um, uh, I had subscribed to a lot of um, what were then called underground newspapers uh, in the United States, which were grassroots countercultural publications. And then um, somehow I found a list that included the journal Art and Language, which I subscribed to. Not American, um, maybe a little bit countercultural, but it was by the British art artists uh, who showed under the name Art and Language, who um, were many regard as the first conceptual artists. And uh, they wanted to, um, among other things, 
integrate criticism into the artwork or use artworks as a form of criticism. And um, they, in fact, proposed that uh, a piece of written criticism could be an artwork. Uh, so it marked a kind of deliberate break with a, a kind of regime of pure visuality. Uh, and um, I, I think that's what got me thinking about working with language as well as visual art. And then um, when I studied as an undergraduate student, I, um, I ended up studying linguistics at Brown University, uh, which was like a, close to the art school I was studying at, the Rhode Island School of Design. And I minored, minored in linguistics, and, and kind of with the idea that um, this had something to do with aesthetics and, um, and, a, and, and, and a kind of like, perhaps even like a meta language of art. And, um, you know, some, I, I think one of the ideas I was interested in, or that influenced me a lot, uh, was a, a, a something called the wharf sapir hypothesis. And uh, that supposed um, this idea of the world being what was called a semantic continuum. So something that was without boundaries and a you know unbroken field, and uh, the idea of these linguists was that different languages break up that continuum into different parts, and um, they're not always the same. And that, so, and an idea like that dispenses with the idea of pure visuality. That in order to recognize, for example, the color red, you have to have an idea a concept a word for it even. Um, so uh, I became very curious about this relationship of language and not only a sense of aesthetics, but also reality. Like what is our reality uh, built up of? And um, there's, uh, this was before I became interested in sociology, but I had like some inkling of uh, that our social reality consisted of belief systems that took on a kind of objectified quality uh, that functioned as reality uh, through language. So it's, it wasn't like a given reality, it was something that, that was socially produced, but then once, uh, these conventions came into being. Uh, they functioned as every bit of reality is empirical reality. I, I hope that makes sense. Anyways, here uh, we're looking at a work uh, by John Baldessari, uh, who I studied with at the California Institute of the Arts. and. Um, He's widely regarded as a great teacher. He had a, he had a huge impact on me. And um, when I first worked with him, uh, it was my first exposure to video art. And uh, you know, video includes sound and image and it offered a, um, a convenient way to put language and image together. And this is exactly what Baldessari was doing in this uh, self-portrait where he's standing in front of a, a palm tree, you know, and it's a compositional don't. But it's also a kind of uh, meta-aesthetic statement that it's not just a given image, it's an image that comments on itself. So it's implying, uh, in this case, he's mocking the criticism of the incorrect photo, but it's still, is invoking a kind of critical dimension. Um, so let's go on to the next. This is one of uh, Joseph Kossuth's paintings. I became interested in Kossuth via art and language because he was part of uh, uh, Art and Language New York. It started out in the UK and 
uh, spread to the US. And um, what I was most interested in about Kasu's work was its self-referential and tautological structure. So here, in this work, he does it to the point of uh, redundancy. And uh, you know, it's the definition of definition. Uh, it makes me think of um, Roland Barthes' notion of kind of the field theory of language where, um, where there's languages seen um, not as one word attached to a thing, but rather a series of differential relations. So one of the ways that Barthes put it is if you want to find out the meaning of a word, you go to a dictionary where it's defined by other words. Uh, so I think this work by Kasuth reflects that condition. Uh, so I like the self-referentiality and um, I like the tautological nature of Kasuth's work. Um, what I was a little bit restless with was that it seemed to imply you could boil down to a kind of essential core. And I started thinking um, that rather even self-description is a dynamic relationship that if you describe something, you change the thing you're describing through the very act of talking about it. So let's go to the next. Um, and yeah, one, uh, one artist who um, really integrated this idea into his work uh, was Dan Graham. And uh, he was working with a kind of cybernetic feedback uh, logic in many, uh, many of his uh, video installations and performance works. And this one is called Performer Audience Mirror. And it makes me laugh because here I am standing in front of a mirror, much like uh, Graham. But in this work, what Graham did was he uh, started out facing the audience and he would describe uh, his own movements and what he was thinking and feeling. Then he would describe members of the audience who of course would react to being described and objectified by him. And it was kind of like a literal reading off of how he perceived them. Then he turned around and did the same thing in, in a mirror. So uh, describing himself by being able to see his own image or seeing an audience member without having direct eye contact. Um, so for me, this was a very important work. And um, I guess we can go to the next video. This is one called Contradicting Statements. And uh, it's, a, it's an old work. I did it when I was still an undergraduate student and it's from uh, 1977. In this piece, each person will contradict the person that came before him. That's not the real description. Yes, that's exactly the description. It's not a real description. She, she's no authority on it. She doesn't know what a description is. He wasn't really thinking about that at all. He was thinking about a description as an explanation of something. That doesn't follow. Uh, I was thinking of uh, licking my eyebrows. He can't lick his eyebrows because his tongue isn't long enough. He 
he can do whatever he wants to do. He can't do it if he doesn't have any eyes. How would that girl know about his eyes? How would that girl know about his tongue? Everybody knows about his tongue and his eyes and his eyebrows. I don't know about any of those. She knows it all too well. She doesn't know what the girl that went before her would know. That's not true at all. Everybody here knows what's happening. True. Wrong. Nobody knows what's happening. John knows what's happening. If John knew what was happening, then he would stop it. I don't think John would stop it, and I think John knows what's happening. John doesn't know everything that's happening, though he does try to exert a great degree degree of control, but he'll be surprised. All right, the ballots are in. Now cast your ballots for number one, or number two, or number three. We have to vote for more than only three because there are ten no, there are eight people. There are no people, there are only squirrels. There are no squirrels, there are only fruit bats. It's obvious that there are five squirrels and three fruit bats. None of this is obvious. All of this is very obvious. Some of this is very obvious, but most of it is not obvious. No one cares. Everyone has to care. Some of us care and some of us don't care. Caring doesn't have anything to do with it. John has nothing to do with it. John has everything to do with it. John won't do anything with it. John can't do anything with it because John is a toilet. Hmm. 
John is not a toilet because John cares. John is my dog. John is um, a dog. John isn't a dog, and John has everything to do with this because John cares. John is dead. John lives in the audio ear of the microphone. John, um, we're not talking about John. Bob lives in the audio ear of the microphone. His name is Mike. This is really getting interesting. This is, this is getting um, so interesting that we're not talking about John anymore. We'll always talk about John. <laughs> talk about John if John is a dog that's a monkey. In this case, each person will talk to the person came before. Yeah, so uh, I intended that piece to be a kind of uh, self-generating work uh, that uh, would have a kind of automatic structure. Um, based on each performer contradicting the next. And uh, I think everybody went eight or nine times, something like that. Um, so it was like a, a, a kind of rules-based performance. Uh, but then, funnily enough, it was also um, my idea was that I would set it in motion and I would be out of the picture, but then they started talking about me, and I was kind of so kind of like subverting uh, my intentions. Um, and in retrospect, I think that uh, that worked out fairly well. Like later, I tried to do self scripting self-referential pieces, and it seemed very dead in comparison. So there was something about performers being in the actual space and responding to each other. Um, uh. So um, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And on to the next slide. Yeah, so later that same year, I did this uh, artist book called Cinematic Moments. And uh, it was the first of several artist books I did. And, and maybe it remains uh, my favorite. And it was um, inspired by having read um, Marcel Proust and especially the motif of um, the epiphany in Proust, which was supposed to um, exemplify instances of uh, so-called involuntary memory, where there would be some kind of uh, sensation, and most famously that of uh, dipping a, a cookie into tea would call back 
the past more vividly than trying to um, deliberately recollect it. Um, and uh, what I did in this, um, I, t I titled this book Cinematic Moments, so it wasn't exactly like a deja vu, but being in an experience where, I tried to describe things where one was an experience uh, where um, you reorient yourself and where it also seems uh, like a, a condition or uh, something that happens that's like a scenario. Uh, so um, let's go to the next slide. So what I did was to write these uh, descriptions of various events and, and, that, and experiences that I had, but then uh, I would place them uh, differently on the page and sometimes they would repeat. And uh, I'll just read a couple of the entries. I write a word, it looks funny. I check to see if it's misspelled, but it's correct. I'm walking down a crowded street. This is the next one. I'm especially aware of the crowd as a collection of individuals. As people flow by, I am bombarded by a succession of images, faces, clothing, gestures, movement. This is intense stimulation. My mind and body react as one. I begin to wonder what kind of comprehensive meaning does all of this have? Whether history will, be need, will need to be written with the camera as well as the pen. And then the third example. Um, I'm rereading something I'd written a few days ago. It's a rough outline of what I had on my mind. Now I can't make sense of it. Without coherent expression, does this idea exist? And then on to the next uh, slide. Um, so skipping ahead, I don't know, 10 years or something, um, to another work where I, I used language. I had gotten into um, like a train of thinking uh, about uh, making art uh, in terms of psychoanalytic theory and the idea of uh, aesthetics as sublimation. And um, I became interested in the opposite, like desublimation, which I, at the time I regarded as a kind of liberatory possibility. And, uh, but I also felt that like an absolute Sublim desublimation wasn't possible. Um, and uh, I did a lot of um, uh, brown impasto works that uh, were kind of keyed to these ideas. But then um, I also did this kind of oddball work where I found this piece of furniture on the street and painted it white. I'm not even sure what what it was from. It was like uh, just on, on a corner near my studio. And um, I made these two signs that were uh, reproductions of personal ads. And uh, one was taken out in, uh, the one on the top was uh, taken out by a man who, um, advertised in uh, New York Magazine, uh, so a little bit of an upscale magazine, and he was trying to make himself attractive uh, to a potential partner by describing his love of the arts, fine dining, things like that. So his um, aestheticism uh, is what would make him attractive, and then I took a second ad out uh, on the bottom, which is placed upside down in relationship uh, to the other ad. And it was taken out by um, someone who advertised in a uh, pornographic newspaper, uh, Al Goldstein's Screw Magazine. And uh, in this ad, uh, the man um, just simply describes the genitalia of the woman he's seeking. Uh, and um, 
And what I wanted to suggest was that one was a sublimated version of the other. Uh, at the time, I was also thinking that um, uh, thinking of these as a, as a, as a polar opposite. Uh, but in retrospect, I started to feel, well, this was like a kind of puritanical, I was superimposing a kind of puritanical set of values on these kind of personal ads. So I uh, want, well, but one thing that interested me was that, um, and I was doing this at a time before personal ads were really popular and, and they tended to be um, more at that point things that people who are kind of desperate took out ads like this. Later, they, you know, with online ads, they would become mainstream. Um, but um, I was in, one of the things that interested me about these ads was that in taking such an ad out, one, or you have to describe yourself. And I started thinking about this in terms of um, what, uh, what the Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser talked about as a process of interpolation where one, and, and Althusser gives uh, an example of what he calls hailing, where uh, someone's walking down the street and a policeman shouts out, hey you, and when you turn around and face the policeman, you've been interpolated into uh, a structure that um, designates you as a, as a subject and, uh, and a relationship vis-a-vis -vis, uh, an institution. And in having to advertise yourself in a personal ad, in a way it, it's a kind of reiteration of that process. Um, so it's almost like a, a, a weird repetition. Uh, and um, yeah, so I was interested in this like, you know, how, you know, before I was talking about how language-based belief systems start to structure uh, your reality and, and assume a kind of objectified form. Um, I think that it plays a part in this uh, sense of you being the person you are, you know, what, what values you identify with, how you see yourself in the world. So anyway, I was, I, even though I was dissatisfied with aspects of this, of this particular work. I was interested in this process of self-description. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I started um, working with uh, personal ads as sociological material. So I wanted to see like a, a range of positions. And uh, for this next exhibition, what I did was I, uh, took a, uh, an issue of um, what was then New York's lifestyle newspaper, The Village Voice, that had a fairly large um, personals ad section. And I, let's go to the next slide. Um, I graphed them according to certain criteria that were in the ads themselves. And oftentimes the ads used like shorthand acronyms because these were uh, print ads. So, you know, the more letters your ad had, the more expensive it was. So a typical ad would, might begin with like the letters SWM, single white male, you know, so this was like a whole set of, um, you know, or MBF, married black female. Um, so on the one hand, these just might seem like bland descriptors, but what I found, especially in the case of US ads, is that they embedded a conception of race as uh, essential to identity in the form of the ad itself. And even, I would say, um, perpetuated a form of racial hierarchy, whether the person taking out the ad was racist or not. And you know, one could make similar arguments about gender and um, that in a way these were um, K 
categorically embedded in dominant ideology. So anyway, I, 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 I made these various graphs according, you know, and trying to understand uh, the array of personal ads as social fields that could be understood according to a range of different criteria. Uh, okay, I guess that maybe that's enough for the slides. Um, and um, after, oh yeah, well there's, so there I, I have like a supposed racial access and then looking at dominant and submissive forms of sexuality. And not every ad appeared on every graph because some didn't mention those qualities. Or uh, in this next one, there's the phrase D and D. That's like another um, shorthand phrase where a lot of the ads had the phrase drug and disease free. So I put D and D as the negative. Uh, and then looking at that in terms of religious versus uh, atheist advertisers, um, not too many religious people were advertising in the voice, as you can see from that graph. Um, but anyway, after working that way for a while, I, I started collaborating with um, uh, Takuji Kogo, who at the time was an artist based in Yokohama. And um, at one point, Takuji took some of the ads we were working with. At that point, I was like superimposing ads uh, over pictures of different locations. And um, Takuji took different ads and turned them into a song. And it was kind of a, like a medley and a novelty song. And um, it was pretty funny, but then I thought like, well, why don't we try to write the best songs that we can using the text of personal ads uh, as lyrics. So let's go to the first of the, um, the YouTube clips. Uh, this one's called I'm Good. Yeah, that one. I just dare for the only word my to eat. A nice Japanese or foreigner woman divorced or married or single any type back puzzle. Welcome just someone who might to enjoy her life with me. I am in my fifties, but but forty nine. I'm not tall, I'm not ugly, not fat. Working for the same are you? Are you? Are you the right person? I I just divorced. divorced. continued to write songs like, uh, and, and part of our premise was that um, everything would be synthesized, including the voices. So we used uh, 
a text to singing synthesizer and um, all of the instrumentation we did from MIDI files. So, uh, yeah, and, and I guess it was like this idea of almost the song as a kind of re-advertising, like giving some uh, additional body uh, or uh, character to the, what was just, what began as a text that we were kind of trying to embody it in a certain way. Um, and it, there was kind of like a trade-off between on the one hand it being parodistic, but then also trying to make it on its own terms. Like they would always be novelty songs, but trying to make them as good as possible. Um, but then what we ran up against uh, after writing about, I think 30 or 40 different songs like this. Uh, well, another thing just technically, um, the synthesizer voices were, are harder to understand than real voices. So after we got into it for a while, we realized that we needed to make these karaoke style images with the lyrics uh, appearing graphically. And then oftentimes people would uh, watch the videos and, and really believe that they could just hear everything perfectly when in fact, without the words, uh, the lyrics would be a little bit garbled. Um, anyway, uh, after a while, um, uh, even online personal ads, which is most, mostly what we use for these songs, started to just be absorbed into social media generally, and it was no longer, uh, we felt kind of a, the kind of dominant form that it, it once was. So we started um, doing songs based on other artists' work, so they'd be kind of like portraits in a way, and we started doing songs based on theory and um, just social issues. Uh, so here's, I think, our newest song. Uh, it's, it's called Be Like Me. And let's do that one also on YouTube. When you are scrolling through social media, do you see the same opinion over and over again? There is so much information on the internet. Does everyone you follow look and sound like you? You like the friends post about their trip to Disney World. Talks up about the top 10 attractions at Disney World.
Well, would you guys be up for one uh, last, uh, like, 11-minute video? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Let me get this up here. Face ID is not going to work. Okay, this is um, called What is a Subject? And uh, it relates to this idea of interpolation, and it's uh, part of like a series of videos I started uh, doing with mannequins. And um, I assume nobody in the audience has uh, a pacemaker or is epileptic, because it starts to have a stroboscopic effect. So I towards the end. Um, if nobody does, then let's roll it. <laughs> it's me. 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 
It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me.
it's me, 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 it's me